I'm going to now talk about another area that I'm fairly passionate about. Uh, and uh, just let me get a, a show of hands. Um, uh, who, who, raise your hand if you're doing radical cystectomies as part of your practice. Very good. Okay, we, we have some trainees here. Yeah, okay, so you are. Um, all right, so, so, um, so here, here are my uh, disclosures. Um, I, I am going to be talking about a clinical trial that's run out of SWOG, and SWOG has some uh, funding from uh, two companies for non-muscle invasive disease trials. Um, the rest of this is all related to uh, non-muscle invasive disease with the exception of QED therapeutics, which has a oral FGFR3 inhibitor, which we're designing a trial for upper tract disease, which I'm not going to be talking about. Um, so um, I'm going to go over some basic things about uh, anatomy and lymph node uh, staging. Uh, I'm going to provide the, the current uh, evidence for uh, the extent of node dissection and then talk about two uh, very exciting clinical trials, uh, one of which is reported out and the other is completed accrual but not reported out. Um, the anatomy is familiar to everybody. Uh, and uh, this is the current uh, staging system. So if you have a single node in the true pelvis, it's N1. If you have multiple nodes in the true pelvis, it's N2. If you have nodes in the common iliac region, uh, it's N3. And just to note that the true pelvis includes uh, the presacral lymph nodes, which I've got uh, circled here. Why presacral? Because there's direct lymphatic drainage from the trigone and posterior wall of the bladder and uh, you can sure see uh, metastatic disease in that uh, region. And the TNM system uh, 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 for adequate staging says you need to have more than 12 lymph nodes identified by the pathologist. Um, my, my claim and teaching point is uh, when you're doing this operation, it's an anatomic node dissection. You remove all of the primary and, uh, lymph node drainage in the true pelvis, so external, internal, and obturator, down completely to the floor of the obturator fossa, and we're going to talk about, you know, the, the so-called extended uh, node dissection. Um, there have been some revisions to the most current uh, staging system. The last edition was 2010. Uh, the current edition was published, I think, in 2018. And um, uh, you can see now uh, involvement of uh, common iliac lymph nodes has pushed the patient back into group three. Uh, where it was always in group uh, four, um, and uh, so that's been one change. And, you know, that matters really in, in the context of our clinical trials and, and trying to uh, develop uh, effect sizes for uh, randomized clinical trials. Uh, but it's an important staging issue. So I, sh I show this figure. It's uh, some data that we put together through a consortium uh, quite a long time ago. It hasn't really changed, but the point of it is that lymph node met metastatic curable, bottom line. Uh, we should not be nihilists about this. Uh, when you encounter this at the time of surgery and it's resectable, um, there's no compelling reason to, to back off, uh, and um, the patient will benefit from this from the standpoint of local control. Um, and it provides very accurate uh, uh, pathologic staging, which is important. Um, and uh, uh, that's the bottom line, is, is that it's uh, curable, and so we should think about that. So we published this paper also quite a long time ago. Uh, it was um, in, a, in a cohort with metastatic disease, and we, metastatic lymph node disease, and we mapped out all of the lymph node metastasis according to pathologic tumor stage. Um, so PT2. PT3, PT4, and here's the aggregate. So what's the take home from this? And I'm going to show you this in, in, the, in, in another slide in a little bit, that in patients who have lymph node metastatic disease, the majority of them actually have multiple lymph node metastasis, and about 30 to 40 percent of them have lymph node metastasis outside the true pelvis. Now, it's still a rational scientific question as to removing those lymph nodes in the extended template, which is up here, common iliac, and maybe even para-aortic, provides a benefit. We don't know the answer to that uh, yet, um, and I am going to walk you through that. But the truth, that's, the, the truth of the matter is that, is that it's there, and we need to um, think about how best to manage that. 
Um, so this is another paper that, that was a prospective mapping study. Ours was not ours, it was retrospective. Um, this is from the German group, also published quite a long time ago. Um, and this really um, sort of was, it was a very important paper when it was published at the time. Um, and it shows essentially what I just described to you uh, with a little higher level of evidence in terms of the frequency of crossover. I'm going to show you this in another study. Um, and the uh, probability of lymph node metastasis in the extended uh, template. Um, so this, is a, this was a very clever study. Beat Roth, uh, is a, well, I think he did this when he was a resident with her Studer. He subsequently did a fellowship at MD Anderson um, and went back, I th think, to, to his home base. But um, this is a radionuclide study where they injected uh, tracer into the bladder and mapped out all of the lymph nodes. Not, not, this was not focused on metastatic disease, but they essentially mapped out all the lymph nodes at, that they had at the time of the cystectomy. They had an intraoperative uh, device for, for identifying these as well. Um, you'll see this curious absence of lymph nodes between the two ureters. That's because Studer doesn't believe in dissecting this area. Um, and his concern has been, and he's a very wise man, so I'm not trying to throw him under the bus, has been particularly in the setting of uh, um, neobladder reconstruction, which as you know, he, he popularized, um, that uh, preserving the hypogastric nerves somehow contributes to uh, 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 good outcomes. I can tell you that I've, I'll just leave it at that. So that's why this is absent here. Um, so what they showed, and they uh, also mapped out um, all of the, uh, lymph nodes. The other thing that's quite curious is that in their hands, the extended node dissection is simply up to where the ureter crosses over the common iliac artery. So when you read any of his publications, when you read any of Harry Herr's publications, that's what they're referring to with an extended uh, template. And again, nothing medial to the ureter. Uh, but this is a very high quality study. And I think the other thing that you know in prostate cancer, as well as bladder cancer, is that Urs has made a, a major point of dissecting the hypogastric nodes uh, right here, and you can see why, because of the uh, preponderance of lymph nodes in that region and the risk of, a, of metastatic disease. In their definition of the extended template, 92% uh, of all of the lymph nodes uh, in this study would be uh, resected, whereas if you uh, just started below the common iliacs, you'd take a little bit of a drop off down to 81%. So a very elegant study. Um, and combined with the mapping studies, I think gives us a very healthy amount of information regarding the anatomic extent of the disease. So this is another paper from our consortia study uh, where we asked the question um, about uh, sensitivity for detecting lymph node metastasis. Um, so you here see the number of lymph nodes removed here on the x-axis and the probability of identifying positive lymph nodes on the Y uh, axis. And you can see that if you have 25 nodes, uh, we've detected 75% of the lymph node metastasis. But if you had uh, 40 lymph nodes, you detected 90%. So the extent of the node dissection and the quality of the analysis by your pathologist, how you present the material to the pathologist. There's been some nice studies done by Bernie Bachner showing that if you present it in packets instead of um, sort of on block, which is the way I was taught by Don Skinner, that the pathologist for some reason or other identifies more lymph nodes. Um, and, uh, but that's the data. Uh, so packet presentation, making sure your pathologist understands exactly what you're giving them my attitude is that, look, if I'm going to spend an hour, hour and a half or more, you know, doing a high-quality node dissection, I expect the pathologist to do a high-quality pathologic evaluation, and, and we get that. So the point of the matter in this analysis is that the more lymph nodes uh, that you have to look at, both the higher the probability you're going to identify lymph node metastasis if they're there, and you'll have a high degree of confidence if, in fact, they're pathologically node negative. Okay. Um, and uh, this data also reflects that same thing, that the more lymph nodes you remove, uh, essentially, the better the outcome in both node negative and node positive 
uh, disease. Um, so this is uh, back to our own institutional uh, data uh, that uh, we found that in a standard node dissection, so external, internal, obturator lymph nodes, we identified 95% of the patients who had N1 disease. Skip metastasis are rare, but they can occur. So you could have common iliac only without true pelvis disease, but that's an uncommon event. And then uh, the extended node dissection uh, increased the node yield by about 34 to 40%, um, and a very high percentage of patients who had locally advanced cancers that were node positive had nodes in the extended uh, template. And I've just shown what the standard node dissection should look like over here. This happens to be what some people refer to as a super extended up to the IMA. Um, it's a, a debate whether going above the aortic bifurcation adds anything other than identifying more lymph nodes. Um, and I'll show you in our trial how we've approached that. Uh, this is um, an analysis of 8710. So this is the neoadjuvant chemotherapy trial. Again, showing that surgical quality affects outcome in both node negative disease and node positive disease. The patients who had more no nodes removed or identified pathologists had better outcomes. Um, and also surgical margin status was also associated with better outcome and independently associated with local pelvic recurrence. Historically, um, when before pelvic lymph node dissections were routinely included in radical cystectomy, local recurrence rates were in the range of 40 to 50 percent. So there's very clear evidence that a thorough pelvic node dissection at the time of radical cystectomy has, has a significant impact on uh, the incidence of local pelvic uh, recurrence. There's a cost of omitting a lymph node dissection. This is SEER data. This was um, published a few years ago, and um, PNX means there were no lymph nodes in the specimen. So that's a surrogate, if you will, for a less than optimal quality radical cystectomy, and you can see that the outcomes are much worse than either pathologically node negative or PN1 uh, disease. And then um, in overall mortality rate, uh, it's in between node positive disease and node negative disease. So it, it's really not um, uh, meeting the standard of care if you don't do a node dissection. Are there exceptions? You bet there are. Uh, unfortunately, we operate on a lot. Some patients with a very hostile pelvis, either due to previous surgery, previous radiation, um, and um, you know you can't always do the thorough node dissection that that you'd like to. But but those are I think the exceptions. Um, this group from Penn uh, has uh, published a number of papers, also looking at SWOG 8710, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy trial and asking questions about um, uh, uh, predictors of local pelvic uh, recurrence. And they've built some models. Uh, this is the SWOG data. This is their own institutional data. And basically, the models show that particularly if you have uh, PT3 or PT4 disease and, and node positive disease, the local pelvic recurrence rate, in their estimate, uh, could be as high as 40%. Uh, percent. Um, this actually led to a uh, clinical trial uh, that was activated in NRG and unfortunately uh, testing a question of adjuvant radiotherapy to reduce the recurrence rate in these high-risk patients and unfortunately it only enrolled three patients before closing it just got caught up in the IO era checkpoint inhibitors which are now being tested in a number of different adjuvant uh, therapy uh, trials so um, question is, is are these uh, curable and when you have uh, lymph node metastasis outside the true uh, pelvis, this is our own data, which would suggest that um, uh, in the pelvis only, yes, you, you would expect to have higher uh, survival probabilities, but even with common iliac disease or above, uh, you can see that it's uh, roughly about 25% to a third of patients have five-year overall survival probability um, and with a good uh, thorough uh, node dissection. Um, these are SEER data. I'll just throw them up there for you, uh, showing uh, the uh, effect on number of lymph nodes related to uh, locally advanced uh, stage and outcome, um, and then uh, a more contemporary uh, study uh, that basically showed the same thing, that the more lymph nodes identified by the pathologist, um, uh, the patients had better overall outcomes. Um, so we're back to this uh, elegant mapping study from Urs Studer. 
Um, and we would agree, I think the, well, the community is in definite agreement, the guidelines are in agreement, and I, we, a bunch of us really fought to get this in the guidelines, uh, that um, standard node dissection, bilateral pelvic node dissection should be part of every radical cystectomy that's done with the intent to cure. And I think the question is, you know, is that the standard of care? And the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, and when you don't know, you do clinical trials. Um, and this has been tested in a number of different um, organ site cancers uh, where there was a preponderance of retrospective data, maybe lower level evidence data suggesting that, you know, a more extensive node dissection was associated with better outcomes. This was reported in pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, um, and when they did the clinical trials, there, none of these organ site cancers showed a benefit to extended node dissection and sometimes even worse uh, survival. Um, and there was a very elegant study reporter from Japan with gastric cancer that also showed no difference. So when you look at other organ sites as a paradigm, there's no level one evidence, at least in these studies. And, and this is a current state of the field um, uh, that there's no level one evidence in these organ sites. So um, when you don't have level one evidence, you do, you do clinical trials. And so I'm going to tell you about two very briefly. Um, and uh, so this is a German trial that was initiated uh, uh, quite a bit earlier than uh, our SWOG trial was initiated. Um, it's been done within the German urologic oncology uh, group uh, led by uh, a fellow named Jürgen Geschwind. He and I have become very good friends over the years because of our two trials. Um, and uh, he made the mistake, and he, I've told him this, so, so I'm not throwing him under the bus, of using this terminology that most urologic oncologists do not like the word limited, because limited implies that you, for some reason or other, haven't done a full or an adequate node dissection. And in fact, um, the limited node dissection in the German trial is the standard node dissection that I've described to you, obturator, external, and internal. Um, so that's, that terminology is, I think, a little bit unfortunate. So this is the uh, consort diagram. Uh, it's a smaller trial than, than ours. Uh, they randomized uh, 437 patients, uh, fairly balanced uh, randomization, uh, expected number of uh, dropouts, and intent to treat analysis. And I think that one of the things that, that's happened here in this trial is this becomes a much smaller study with lower power to detect small differences. And it's highly unlikely that an extended node dissection is going to be associated with a dramatic improvement in progression-free or overall survival. So we're looking for small differences um, anyway. Uh, and this is the Kaplan-Meier plot for recurrence-free survival, no difference. Uh, the, uh, for five-year cancer-specific survival, no difference. And it was essentially reported out as a negative trial. Uh, they're still trying to get this published. For some reason or other, JCO turned them down despite uh, a lot of um, cajoling on some of our parts. Uh, but why was it a negative trial? So it's designed a little bit differently. They included T1s, and they had a, a fairly significant number of their patients that had T1 and T2 disease, which you could argue would have a more favorable outcome. And uh, just doing a more extensive node dissection is just doing a more extensive node dissection without providing any benefit. Um, there is one caveat with the limited that they didn't go below the obturator nerve, and that really is um, part and parcel of the standard node dissection. They a priori did not allow neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, and uh, um, our trial does. It was designed a little bit in a little bit more contemporary uh, environment. And there's one post hoc unplanned analysis that shows possibly a benefit in T2, but that's post hoc, not pre planned, and doesn't really, at best, it's hypothesis generating. So, negative trial. Um, the SWOG trial uh, is um, identical design with the exception of the extent of the standard node dissection. We allowed neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Um, and uh, the minimum extent of the extended node dissection had to go up at least to the aortic bifurcation and include the so-called uh, presciatic or fossa of Marcy uh, lymph nodes. And um, when you reflect the external iliac artery and vein medially in the common iliac, 
after you've done your node dissection, there's a ton of stuff still there. And so um, you kind of have to go after that because uh, well, there's a lot of lymph nodes there. And then we encouraged adjuvant chemotherapy in patients who had residual local advanced disease, powered to detect about a 10 to 12% improvement in three-year disease-free survival from 55% in the control arm to 65% in the extended arm. We were not comfortable and it wasn't practical to go down to any smaller differences because it would be too large of a trial and we didn't really think that we could pull that off. Although in retrospect, I think we could have because um, we, we fully accrued the trial uh, in the expected time period of five years. Um, so these are just the power calculations, uh, the hazard ratios for those of you that, that, that like that. First patient was enrolled in August 2011. We registered uh, 659 and randomized 620 patients, and uh, we're in our second year of follow-up. Um, this was a very rigorous quality control effort to credential surgeons. Um, I, I, as the principal investigator, have the responsibility along with of, of evaluating every single op path report. A each of us had to submit photos for every uh, case. Um, and our, our goal in all of this was when we write the paper, regardless of what the outcome is, that we would have as few questions as possible about did the patient get the operation that they were randomized to. Um, and uh, this is the accrual data. Uh, and uh, I've, I've highlighted a couple of things over here on the right. Um, we have uh, uh, about 70% of the patients were clinical T2. And a very high percentage of our patients got neoadjuvant chemotherapy. 56% got neoadjuvant, 88% of that was cisplatin. So our surgeons and medical oncologists were drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, and this is the highest reported utilization of, of cisplatin-based chemotherapy anywhere that I'm aware of. Um, the two trials have some significant differences. I've pointed those out along the way. Um, I don't know if, you know, what's going to be the outcome of our trial. We'll report out in about a year and a half. But these two trials um, alone and hopefully collectively will give us a lot more data points around the utility or lack thereof of an extended node dissection. And the beauty about it is it provides a whole host of other secondary endpoints to take a look at and we're designing a fair amount of translational work to get at some of the molecular correlates of lymph node metastasis and outcome and resistance to chemotherapy. So in summary, um, our guidelines uh, are very clear about the uh, need for a bilateral pelvic node dissection uh, associated with um, radical cystectomy. Uh, it provides um, important local uh, uh, control and um, extending the node dissection identifies more metastasis and uh, can increase the end stage and randomized trials. So, thanks.